related to our experiences generally in the healthcare setting and very specifically in the complicated information around COVID-19. So just to give you a little feedback on the agenda for today, uh, first we're gonna talk about what is health literacy and then think about how common it is and then how it can impact health and then what we can do to improve it. So first, let's think about health literacy. And like I mentioned before, thinking about how complicated health information can be and what sort of uh, issues come up and what things we have to understand and learn. Uh, really, uh, you know, you can start to think about it even perhaps if you want to add anything in the comments about what kinds of health information we have to think through and what things we need to understand to keep ourselves and our families healthy. There's health information of all kinds. There's you know, prescription medicine. There's how to navigate a health system. There's preventive health information. Uh, there's information on uh, you know, what to do in certain circumstances. There's information online that we might want to look up to understand if something is urgent or not urgent. And so I put these examples here in languages that are not familiar to me to sort of uh, emphasize what it might be like if we have an array of health information around us that we can't necessarily even understand exactly what it's saying to us, but we know it's health information and might be relevant to us. So of course, as I mentioned, we use this kind of health information for a lot of reasons, to take care of our family, our children, um, our you know, extended families, uh, to keep ourselves safe uh, in times of COVID-19, uh, to understand how developmentally our young people, or the infants, toddlers, uh, adolescents are being raised to help navigate online health information and to do things like eat healthy and find the foods that will keep us healthy with our chronic conditions to manage them or to keep ourselves feeling, you know, fit as a fiddle uh, every day. So if we think about all that health information, that brings us to the definition of health literacy. So in the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act of 2010, health literacy was defined like this. Health literacy is the degree to which an individual has the capacity to obtain, communicate, process, and understand basic health information and services to make appropriate health decisions. So you think about all those pieces of the puzzle that allow someone to be health literate. You have to obtain the information, so you have to know where to go. You have to communicate the health information, including being able to ask questions about what you don't understand and know where to get that information and who is a reliable source. You have to process that health information. Wait, they're saying you know, not to eat uh, potatoes. How does that apply to the food I eat here, which is you know, not usually potatoes, might mostly include rice. So does that include my, my you know, diet? How does that impact me? So thinking about how information that's generally communicated might be relevant to someone's particular health circumstances. And then, of course, to understand that information uh, and services to make appropriate health decisions for issues that concern you. And again, we might all have different thoughts sometimes about what that appropriate uh, health decision is, but you want to have full information as you make those choices about, well, I'd like this kind of care or that kind of care uh, for a particular health condition. So you can see here, uh, you know, people sort of thinking through different pieces of the puzzle of what makes us have health literacy. And as you can imagine, it's not just individuals, right, in these circumstances. We talked about health literacy may be included and related to people's uh, communication within families and meeting needs of people within families, but it also matters what settings people are receiving care. Some healthcare settings may be really careful about making sure people understand health information and have it delivered in ways that are very easy for them to synthesize, very relevant to them culturally, uh, very appropriate for their health circumstances. So people may have different uh, abilities or ways to understand health information, but the settings in which they receive that health information, even how accessible the online information is, if it's the first thing that comes up in Google is reliable health information, that can really matter in terms of whether people you know, can have health literacy in their communities, in their places as well. 
And then, of course, your health professionals really matter, too. So does your doctor communicate clearly? Do they talk slowly enough? Uh, do they make sure that they have uh, ways in which uh, they're communicating and asking you, giving you time to answer, to ask questions that you might have, and giving you appropriate responses to allow you to understand the health information that you need? And all that in the health literacy interface is what allows us to be health literate. So some other definitions of health literacy, if we think through, we talked about sort of that obtain, process, understand information, is thinking then about what other aspects are important for health literacy. So we kind of talked about in that first definition this idea of personal health literacy. So this degree in which individuals have the ability to find, understand, and use health information and services to inform their health-related decisions and actions for themselves and others. So this is kind of the updated version from the really important public health benchmarking um, a document around what we want to be as a population, this Healthy People 2030, these are our goals. So we want everyone to have this personal health literacy for these reasons we've talked about. And then they just recently added this additional goal, which is organizational health literacy. And this is the degree to which organizations, so healthcare settings, the professionals within them, uh, equitably ensure individuals can find, understand, and use health information and services to inform their health-related decisions and actions for themselves and others. So it really puts the responsibility on that interface, not just some individual's responsibility to like, oh my gosh, I can't understand this, this is very stressful, but to really think about the organizations that you know, should assuage our concerns and help us find uh, health information that we need at the right time for us. So just to reiterate, health information and health literacy specifically is not simply the ability to read. While basic reading skills can be very important to building health literacy, you have to do a lot of other things. And if we think about our own health experiences and navigating health situations that we've all had, you can think about all the things that you have to do. You have to understand prescription drug bottles, appointment slips, medication, medical education brochures, doctor's directions, uh, consent forms. What could be more complicated than a consent form? Uh, and then we have to negotiate complex healthcare systems where we may have specialists and primary care and lab appointments and other things and just even navigating within them and then the payment structures around them can be very stressful and complicated. So these demand a lot of skills. They demand reading, listening, analytical, and decision-making skills, and the ability to apply those skills in health situations. And so health literacy really varies by context, as we talked about, and by setting, and is not only related to years of education and general reading ability. So you think of all of us when we're in a stressful situation, we've learned a new health thing about ourselves we did not know, it could be really hard to process a lot of complicated information around what we might need for that you know, cancer treatment or what decisions we might need to make about our own care. So health literacy can be related to things like your ability to read, but it's not only this. And so sometimes years of education can be not at all related to people's ability to process health information in that moment. And also, a person who functions adequately at home or at work may have marginal or inadequate health literacy in a healthcare environment due to the new information, due to stress, due to experiences, or on the flip side, a healthcare setting that's really, again, very comforting to people, knows to meet people where they are and where their needs are for health information, can really make it so people who cannot read very well can feel very comfortable that their questions are answered, their needs are met, the health information they need is relevant to them. So while they may have inadequate literacy in some other circumstances, they would have really high health literacy because the setting and the professionals around them and perhaps their family structure can help support their journey towards better health. So of course, health literacy really matters then in terms of people's uh, experiences. It can really impact their ability to navigate a healthcare system, again, including locating providers and services and filling out forms so your doctor has all the right information about you and what you need. Uh, can matter in terms of how you share personal and health information with providers. It can matter in terms of how you engage with self-care and understand how to manage your chronic disease. 
And it can also help you understand when and how to adapt health-promoting behaviors, such as exercising or eating a healthy diet, and which ones are the right for you in the circumstances you're in. Um, and then finally, also to act on new health-related news and announcements. So again, in COVID-19, I think all of us have felt you know, health illiterate you know, very often, right? We haven't been able to understand a lot of what's going on, in part because the information keeps changing, and you need to find reliable sources, and you need to you know, sort of uh, understand that sometimes that information will change. And so what was good advice three months ago may be really different right now. And so you need to know how to find the people that are giving you updated information, and even where those websites might be and where to turn to. So of course, all of this impacts important things that we care about, our health outcomes, of course, as well as our healthcare costs and the quality of healthcare that we receive. And it's important to acknowledge that often people with low health literacy might have other factors that might lead to poor health status. So I, we'll talk about this in a minute, but many people with low health literacy may come from poorer backgrounds because they did have less access to health information. Um, they may uh, be, um, uh, English may not be their first language. Uh, and so in this case, these sort of how it all intersects and then what we need to do about it are really important to consider what those factors look like. And many may live in contexts that make it more difficult to be health literate um, because the information, you know, even Wi-Fi these days is so important to accessing health information. If you do not have reliable Wi-Fi, it can be really challenging to get health information that you need. And of course, if you don't understand health information, and probably many of us have felt this before, um, and particularly people who are not able to read well, they know that to navigate society, you often need to be able to read really well. And even those of us who can read really well can often find if you don't understand something, you may feel ashamed about it, and you may not want to ask, right? You can be very uncomfortable being asked if, about your literacy skills if you do not read well. And many people who do not read well have often developed strategies to compensate for that. And so they don't want, in a healthcare setting, to be asked, like, can you read this? Because that will make them feel even more ashamed and perhaps you know, fall deeper into their shell. And then, the, again, ability and access to health information will be limited. And so this kind of piece of how to build better healthcare systems to meet patients' needs where they are with the needs they have is really important. So how does this apply to Hawaii? And I think again, you know, as you think through your own health experiences, and if you've ever felt like you did, you had low health literacy in a circumstance, um, think about some of these examples we had from a study we did on uh, neighbor islands about health literacy, health communication challenges, specifically looking into cancer screening among rural Native Hawaiian and Filipino women who we talked to about their healthcare uh, experiences around this cancer screening. And so here are a couple of quotes I thought uh, were really valuable to understand the circumstances. So the first is somebody who could not read well. And they said, you know, I go into the healthcare sitting, and the assumption is that everyone can read. But not everyone can read. And I think for many people who come from backgrounds where most people around them went to college, uh, many have advanced degrees, it's hard to remember that there's a whole set of people who may not be able to read well for a variety of reasons. Uh, maybe they didn't have good access to health information or, or good access to education as they were growing up. Maybe they had an undiagnosed learning disability, right, and were able to get through but didn't uh, get all the education experiences that they needed. Um, and again, there may be other reasons. Maybe their eyesight is poor, right, in that circumstance, and they don't sort of can't read the information right before them. But the assumption is, like, take this information and, you know, do what you will with it, and that is, you know, a false assumption. The second is somebody saying this. I'm sitting in the doctor's office and, you know, sitting there like you know what he's talking about and not knowing one thing he said. Um, and so you walk out saying to yourself, what's wrong with me? You come out of there, plus part of it, you don't want to sound stupid. And you know they're in a rush, so, and the doctor's in a rush to get out of there. And so you don't ask questions, and you just sit there feeling so small that you didn't get to ask the questions about the healthcare setting because you didn't understand what they were saying, but you didn't want to look dumb. You didn't want to bother them. They're probably in a rush. There was no time. And so how do we figure out how to build better healthcare systems to uh, build health literacy for somebody like, you know, in these circumstances, which again, I think many of us have felt before. And then finally, thinking about the online experience. You know, sometimes, so this person says, uh, sometimes you go to the website and they have so much different information on it. 
and it doesn't jive with what you heard at the office. And so then you go to the website and they bring up all these websites and you try to click and you don't know which one to choose and which one's the right one and you go to the next one, you go to the next one and you know it's really hard. And so again, you can think about how this might apply to something like you know, a cancer sort of journey trying to figure out what treatments are the right ones for you in this circumstance and this experience or certainly trying to understand around how to keep yourself safe in the time of COVID-19 and what the rules are and how they're changing and when you know you should go to the grocery store and what you can get there and what the rules are and you know how to you know when to get the vaccine and when you have access to it and how that looks and just thinking about all that complicated information available on websites much less within the environments of social media and other places where there may be deliberate health misinformation as well. So if we think about health literacy and thinking about how common this is, uh, let's sort of get, learn some information from some big national studies about this. So to back up first, think about how we would even measure this, right? We've talked about a lot of complicated pieces that are related to health literacy. So some of the first measures of health literacy at the individual level were developed in the 1990s. And I first started working in this area in the 1990s, working with a professor who developed this first instrument, the Rapid Estimate of Adult Literacy in Medicine. And she was doing work in a healthcare setting and realized that when she was giving everyone uh, this um, mini mental status exam to see how they were doing around uh, their mental uh, sort of capacity to sign consent forms for a study she was doing in this um, low income hospital in Louisiana, she found that every single person turned out to essentially on this mini mental status exam came up as if they had dementia. She's like, I don't think every single person we've talked to officially has dementia. But it turns out the mini mental status exam has some questions that assume you know how to read and do math. And essentially, many of these people in this low income setting in Louisiana had not had good educational experiences as they were growing up. Many had not finished high school um, and didn't have access to that kind of reading skills you know, over time. And so she was like, wait a second, all these people are in our healthcare setting and they can't read you know, basic information. What are we going to do? We should try to understand what this skill scale looks like. And so she developed this realm, uh, which is a kind of um a test where you just basically have 66 words and you, you know, sort of ask people, can you read these medical words? Um, and that is this, the realm. And it's a really commonly given health literacy test. The words are like fat, flu, pill, dose. And it goes up to words like uh, colitis, uh, hemorrhoids. And so you can get a sense of people's understanding of basic health terminology. Another test developed not that long after the realm as they started to recognize the really high prevalence of people who struggled with this basic health information was called the TOFLA, the Test of Functional Health Literacy in Adults, or there's also the short version of the TOFLA. And this one asks you to comprehend passages about preparing for something like an x-ray um, or for Medicaid rights. Uh, and so you think about like the medical words of the realm, these are more like actual uh, sort of fill in the blanks around health information used in actual context of what people would be doing, right? Figuring out what they can eat before an x-ray, for instance. Um, and so that's been a really commonly used test as well. And then finally, I have here an example from the newest vital sign. And this is where the test is essentially, you're given this uh, form, which is like from a uh, you know, label from an ice cream, and you're asked to understand if you can understand information from this nutrition label. So can you understand what you should not eat due to allergies, or how much is a serving relevant to you? Um, so this one is testing not only your health literacy, but also your health numeracy and your ability to understand information that includes you know, sort of mathematics in the background as well, which can be challenging for many of us also. And then another way we measure health literacy is ask people their experiences. And so these are some really commonly given self-report items. So the first is, you know, how often do you have problems learning about your medical condition because of difficulty understanding written information? So if somebody says often, always, sometimes, versus occasionally or never, those first three choices mean they may have some challenges with health literacy. And there are three questions here in this kind of commonly given scale, but we often do just this last question. And you can think how often this applies to you. So how confident are you filling out medical forms by yourself? Extremely, quite a bit, somewhat, versus a little bit, um, not at all. 
So you think about sort of saying a little bit, not at all. Uh, I think I might have said that backwards. Um, no, no, that's correct. So a little bit or not at all means uh, that you're not confident, right? So you may have low health literacy. So you may be struggling with health information. And so we try to understand, again, how many people report that they do not feel confident filling out medical forms by your, themselves. So you guys can think you know, what you would say uh, given these questions and how that might vary by context. So if we think about, though, these sort of measures, and these measures are really those basic skills, right? Can you do these basic types of health information? Fill out forms, you know, uh, understand nutrition labels. But again, as at the beginning, we talked about the whole array of the pieces that go into health literacy. And so we think about really modern tools, and we've been developing new tools that really um, try to help people think about differences not only about reading ability, but health-related background knowledge, familiarity with language and materials, right? We can all think of all the complicated words that, you know, something like hypertension, that you might not know what hypertension means, uh, but you might know you have high blood pressure. But then if you're going to the doctor a lot and you're learning about your hypertension and et cetera, et cetera, and you may become very familiar with that word. So you may get higher health literacy specifically around complex terminology around your blood pressure. But then with a whole new health issue, you may not know those words at all. Again, cultural differences in approaches to health, limited English proficiency, and again, this role of providers and settings are all things that the sort of assessment tools need to measure and think about. So all that is to get us to the place where we'll talk a little bit about uh, this major national assessment of adult literacy. And this is really the first one um, and the only one they've done in the United States that's this population-based health literacy assessment. So they talked to about 20,000 adults aged 16 to older in the United States. And they assessed English literacy using prose, uh, document, and quantitative scales. So the tasks were across three domains. They were clinical questions. So can you fill out a patient form? Prevention. So can you follow guidelines for age-appropriate health information services? Um, and then navigation of the healthcare system. So can you understand what services your health insurance plan will cover, right? So very important to us. And then they measured health literacy across this domain and levels of scales. So proficient means you can perform all the most complex you know, activities. Intermediate means you could do some of the you know, moderately challenging activities. Basic, you could do the very basic challenges. Um, and then below basic means you could perform um, only the most simple ones. And then non-literate in English meant you were not able to um, complete the screening task where you didn't speak English or Spanish, which was who they, the other language they measured in this case. And so here's some examples of what that would mean in practice. So a below basic skill would be circling the date of a medical appointment on a hospital appointment slip. Like can you even, you know, can you use that information to figure out when you need to go to the doctor? Basic would be you'd read a, a clearly written, you know, a pamphlet designed for easy understandability. And then from that, you would interpret and learn two reasons a person should be tested for a specific disease. And so actually, you can see here, right here on, uh, I guess I can point. I'm not sure where my pointer is. But anyway, the line there, the average score of 245 uh, is where most people ended up, right? Sort of between these basic skills and then these intermediate and proficient skills. So an intermediate skill will be determining what time a person should take a prescription medicine based on the information on the drug label that relates to the timing of medication to eating. And probably every single person in the, you know, in our Zoom room here has had that experience of having to figure out that, you know, intermediate level task. Uh, and so you think about if the average, you know, person in the United States wasn't able to confidently score in that area. And then finally, proficient, also a very important task for us, is to calculate in things like an employee share of health insurance costs for a year using a table, right? So that might be something that's very relevant. And so here this shows you the percentage of adults in each of the literacy levels uh, in 2003. And this shows you the health one, which is where the arrow is, which is what we've been talking about specifically. But again, they also ask people generally about their prose, document, and quantitative literacy around other domains, not just including health. But you can see here health. So only 12% of Americans scored in that proficient area. That's where the hatching is and the 12%. About 53% of Americans performed in the uh, proficient area. 
Only 22 could perform the sort of set of basic tasks. And then again, 14% of Americans performed in the below basic area. So if we think about who that population is that's really struggling with health information, this is a figure from that study to show you who that might be. So the characteristics are on um, uh, the first column there. So characteristics like that person did not graduate from high school, they didn't speak English before they started school, they reported poor health, um, so it was obviously someone we want to have good access to health information, uh, that they're from a Hispanic background, they're over 65, no medical insurance, et cetera, et cetera. So the next column is showing the percentage of people in that population that are in the below basic category. So you can see in below basic, 51% did not graduate from high school, 39% did not speak English before starting school, 10% of adults reporting in poor health, 35% uh, Hispanic, 31% uh, over 65 compared to the percent in the total population. So you see that the disproportionate, for instance, 15% of the population in the United States did not graduate from high school, but in the below basic population, 51% of them did not graduate from high school. So you really think about who has vulnerabilities here and who we need to make sure to take care of as a society in our healthcare settings uh, to build better health for our communities. So again, thinking about you know, bringing this home to Hawaii, what about us here? Um, and so this is from a study we did uh, a few years ago now about taking some of these tests, uh, the one that I showed you before with the circle that was asking people how often they, you know, what the confidence they felt with consent form or filling out forms in the medical setting. And you can see here, uh, this is an abstract from this study, and we found that low health literacy really varied significantly by the groups of importance to us in Hawaii, um, or many of the racial ethnic groups that we want to make sure are getting access to strong health care in our state. Um, it varied significantly from about 24% of Filipinos reported poor health literacy, 20 uh, percent of other Asian Pacific Islanders, 16 percent of the Japanese population that we um, that had been interviewed, 16 percent of Native Hawaiians, and 13 percent of whites um, we saw that uh, had low health literacy. So that was significantly different across racial ethnic groups, but also was relatively high um, for all. Um, and then low health literacy, as measured here, was related to things such as poor self-rated health, uh, depression, um, and diabetes. Diabetes. So again, the sort of relationship between these sort of measures of people's understanding of health information and confidence in those spaces are really related to health outcomes uh, that matter to us. So all that's kind of, uh, you know, both familiar and a little depressing. And so what can we do to improve? What do we need to do with this information to make better healthcare systems? Um, and also welcome your ideas about your own experiences, what has worked well for you, what has made you feel confident receiving health information and accessing health information, even if it is confusing um, at first, like what's made that easier to build your own health literacy? So again, if we think about how to build this, it is this interface between settings and people and the professionals, right? And so we need to build a system that works well together to build health literacy for ourselves as individuals, for our families, and of course, for our communities. Certainly COVID-19 has showed us the importance of population level health um, and community level health understanding uh, for the better well-being of us all. So there's a lot of work in this area about what we can do to build better health. So we have a national action plan to improve health literacy. We have something called Health Literacy Universal Precautions Toolkit. And this works under the assumption that everyone, even the most highly educated person, really prefers straightforward and simple health information, in part because of stressful times, you really want health information that's easy to understand. Um, and so, uh, that sort of, instead of saying, oh, you, you don't read well, so let me give you this other stuff, we give everyone information that's easy to understand, uh, which most people, you know, appreciate because, again, it can be hard to uh, sort through all the information around that you need to do to keep yourself healthy. And then finally, this sort of building health literate organizations. So thinking about the touch points within the healthcare setting that make it easy to understand health information. From the moment you walk in uh, and talk to the receptionist and get the, fill, you know, the form to fill out versus you know, how to use your online health portal and who, how much time you have with your doctor and what kind of questions the doctor asks and how the signage is just in the building themselves. And so if we build these health, you know, these health organizations well, uh, that's really important. And just 
to highlight a recent study we did in this area, uh, we really thought about then how COVID-19 has changed our healthcare setting and our access to them and our telehealth. You know, now we have the, you know, all these new technologies we can use to talk to our providers and sort of thinking about really how that builds us opportunities to really think through what's working well in those online spaces to talk to your doctor. Um, what's making it hard to connect? Uh, when do you want to be able to go in? What would you need you know, to really make sure we're building patient-centered care and building health literacy within our organizations, within our healthcare organizations? And as we think through all the places in which uh, health literacy can be built and what those uh, sort of nexuses are where we need to build uh, health literate organizations and the health literacy interface where people meet settings, meet professionals, there is a piece that I think is super relevant to our state here, which is health literacy is built in families, right? And really important to us in Hawaii is our families and our extended families and our friend networks and these social networks around us that we aren't just individuals sort of accessing health information, where people, again, accessing health information for others, on behalf of others, with others, and really making health decisions often with others in communities, with our spouses, with our kids, with our, you know, um, children, trying, trying to help them sort through, um, you know, and sometimes for our neighbors, right, helping them understand what to do, or our extended families. And so that is a really important part of a strength that we have in this state around how we build and think about you know, promoting health literacy is really thinking about how that works in a social network. Because we find, understand, and use health information and services to inform health-related decisions and actions for ourselves and others, right? Remember that sort of definition of health literacy. So again, we help people access health information. We talk with our friends uh, and our peers around health questions. So these moms sort of sitting with their babies, like, is your baby eating? What are you doing? What's this like? What's this developmental stage? We talk through with our friends, right? Like, are you having this experience? Is this like for you? You know, what are you eating? How are you managing your diabetes? Right, we have those conversations with each other. And then of course we have to make really sometimes quite complicated decisions around end of life care, um, you know, where to take care of a family member who has dementia uh, together, right, in communities and on behalf sometimes of others. So really thinking of health literacy as not an individual experience, and not only an individual experience with their doctor or with the healthcare setting, but really as a social experience within social networks, um, and especially family um, and friend networks, again, really being a really important part of how we organize our health experiences and understandings in this state. And so there are some definitions of health literacy that really think about this. So thinking about health literacy as the personal characteristics and also the social resources needed for individuals and communities to understand, appraise, um, access, and use health information and services. So the World Health Organization has really done some work to think about health literacy, not only as these you know, individual experiences, but also as social resources. And you probably can all think of the person who knows the right person to talk to to get the answer for the thing. Like, where do you get that you know, free thing? Or where do you get that delicious you know, fruit? Or you know, where do I go to ask these questions? And there's always somebody who has really strong social resources. And that can be a really important part of health literacy as well. So again, health literacy isn't just the individual, it's also related to the social environment around you. Um, and that is a complex phenomenon involving families, communities, and systems. And just really think that this is so important to us in Hawaii. So just wanted to highlight a recent study we also did around uh, chronic care management and talk to people hospitalized here in the state of Hawaii. And we found in particular for Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders with chronic health conditions, um, the family members um, and close friends were really important in terms of understanding what they needed to manage their chronic condition. And so that that is a place where we could consider interventions if we're going to build better healthcare systems, making sure we're not just talking to an individual, but we're talking to the people around them that help support their health to explain, oh, okay, these are what you need to eat to stay healthy. This is what you need to think about, right? Because we do make a lot of those choices uh, in collaboration with each other. 
And so here's from another study. This was not my team, but is a really uh, kind of thinking about health and building health from a strength-based approach. Uh, that Marshallese migrants, for instance, in this study, they found they were highly reliant on social networks for their health care. And this was because of strong mutual trust and the values assigned specifically to inter interdependency within their culture, which I think is true of many cultures in Hawaii, that we have this strong value assigned in community and interdependency with one another. Um, and that that really is a strength-based approach we can think and draw upon as we think about how to build health literacy in our communities. And so this is just to show you a little figure from our study about people that were hospitalized with this preventable condition in Hawaii. And this may be a little uh, strong, uh, hard to read on your computer, but it's essentially two sides. One side is the people we talk to, which are the blue dots, all the people we talk to uh, with low health literacy. And then on the right-hand side, uh, the people we talk to with high health literacy are the lighter. The dots actually are um, uh, men and the squares are women, I think. I forget which way it goes. But anyway, essentially you can see the individuals in the centers of their network. And you can see a couple of people um, there on the low health literacy side who had no one in their social network. See those two blue dots all by themselves? So we asked them, who do you talk to about your health? They said no one. But you can see most people had some array of people around them. So their spouse, their child, a friend that they talked to specifically about their health experiences. And what you can see here also, besides the fact that most people had someone they said that they talked to around their health condition, um, you can also see how health literacy may be built within these social networks. So on the low health literacy side, essentially the green around the colors of the people uh, surrounding the blue dots are showing you by the darkness of how green that is, how low their education is. Essentially, they're like last uh, grade completed in school. So darker means they were less likely to have gone to college and more likely to have only gone through high school. So what you can see if you compare the low health literacy side versus the high health literacy side is that people in the low health literacy side are also surrounded by social networks that may have less health education. So again, if we think of a strength-based approach, if we intervene within those social networks, we may be impacting you know, a whole sort of set of people who might have had less education access around giving strong health information to build better health. And just to reiterate, you know, where we are today, uh, you know, I gave this talk last year in the time of COVID thinking, oh, well, this is, you know, maybe we're getting to the end of time of COVID. Here we continue on in the time of COVID. But really thinking about health literacy in this time, it just really is, you know, every day becomes more uh, important than ever in this time. And so we had done this article, you know, about a year ago. And um, now here we are, right? So health misinformation, all this sort of deliberate health misinformation around vaccines and other things, you know, how do we sort through that? Who do we talk to? Who do we understand? Who is our trusted resource? Really are, you know, very important questions we still are struggling with and really how strong messaging gets out to the public uh, and then out to patients in specific settings for specific conditions, right? What do we make sure to do that in this time where we are often very distant from each other, where we can't have the face-to-face -face conversations? You know, we're not now, right? We're doing this over Zoom. Uh, and so so it really doesn't always build trust and relationships in ways that can be really important for building health literacy. So what do we do? How do we make sure we build health literacy in this time? And then specifically, we've done a recent study around digital health literacy and thinking about how young people in particular uh, build their sort of social networks around digital health literacy and figuring out how they use social media to connect to each other to try to you know, understand health information or not um, is something we've been working on and is a really important area uh, to continue on, right? Because young people, of course, here, you know, many of them are not sure uh, about um, you know, what to do in the time of COVID-19 in particular and how it applies to them, right? Um, we certainly want them uh, to stay safe as well. So to kind of sum up the uh, overarching uh, things we've talked about is really we think about health literacy and what it is. It's really dependent on a, you know, two sets of things, the individual and the systemic factors around that individual, the settings, uh, the providers, the organizations, the families, the social networks. Um, so it matters the communication skills of lay people and professionals, the knowledge of the lay people and professionals around health topics, what the social norms are right around you, what feels like the thing is, of course, I'll do this thing, right? Of course, I'll wear a mask, right? And why? 
course I'll wear a mask. No problem here, right? You go to the, you know, Louisiana, like, of course I will not wear a mask, right? That, that makes a big difference in people's health literacy and understanding of health information. Um, thinking of the demands and what we ask of people within our healthcare settings and public health systems. Um, again, what do we do in changing technology, right? The change to telehealth in this moment of, you know, many of us connecting now with our providers in online forums that we wouldn't have used, you know, two years ago. Um, and again, how health information is then delivered to us. The demands of the context and situation and how shocking or disturbing the healthcare information may be. And the community and family context in which we receive this information. So the conclusions are, one is that you know, there's no one answer to how to build health literacy, right? It really matters how a community and what they need. Um, it really matters what an individual needs and what they want. Um, and so we really have to think about our healthcare set settings as being patient-centered to build health literacy and our public health. You know, I'm from public health uh, is essentially how we build you know, strong uh, population level health communication strategies. Again, including social and family networks in clinical care and our interventions really might help meet patient preferences and help us achieve health equity across populations, building on strengths across communities um, that may have health inequities. Um, and that many, but of course not all patients, wish to include social networks um, in interventions, right? So social networks are not always positive, right? We can see sort of health misinformation networks happening as well. And, you know, you end up in an echo chamber where it's like, you know, you're down a rabbit hole and the information is all bad there, but it's a lot of it. And so it's hard to sort through what's the real information, right? So how do we make sure we build strong social networks that connect to reliable health information with the right person to guide or, you know, to see that network with strong uh, access to health information. And, you know, you can see here that, you know, social isolation, of course, can be bad in and of itself. So it's kind of a lonely guy here. Um, maybe, hopefully, that's not the end. Oh, good. I have a happy slide to end. I didn't want to <laughs> lonely guy. But just thinking again about how health literacy and how we make sure that people who are alone, right, do have access to a reliable person they can call even for informal questions, right, around health or health care uh, needs. And so finally, to end on a happier note than that uh, sort of uh, uh, individual who hopefully somewhere, you know, is just sitting alone for a minute and actually has, uh, you know,